The Victory Garden is provided in part by Hillis's. Complete floral design, culinary market, and customized full-service catering. Hillis's, located in the historic Haymarket District, Lincoln, Nebraska. Hello and welcome to the Victory Garden. I'm Roger Swain. Today, Bob Smouse visits Pat's Perennials in Woodenville, Washington. Pat's daughter persuaded her to sell a few of the extra plants she was growing to help with college tuition payments. That was a few years ago. Her daughter has since graduated. Mom's business has expanded more than she ever imagined, growing from a sales area the size of a wheelbarrow to several acres. Back here, I'll be sowing vegetables for the fall, telling you how to enter our victory garden contest and i'll be harvesting broccoli from marion's recipe that's all just ahead so please stay tuned funding for this program was provided by the corporation for public broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. And by helping you grow eyes. Grow Group and your local Grow Eyes centers. Nurseries and garden centers providing for all your yard and garden needs. Grow Eyes. Stern's miracle Grow products. Bringing the joy of gardening to generations of Americans. N.K. Lawn and Garden. Seeds, lawn products, gardening books, and products for the young gardener. Helping families grow for over a century. A couple of weeks ago, we watched Lucinda Mays working on her water garden, and there's no addition to any landscape that brings as much pleasure as water. It's not just the water lilies or the flowering rushes or the irises. It's the other organisms that water attracts. I don't know where the frogs came from. There were no frogs in the garden until I put in this pond. And now we have lots of frogs. They're a native species, and I don't know where they came from, but I do know where the goldfish came from. They came from a pet store. I had just a couple of them originally, and now look, I've got dozens. And what I've noticed over the years is that the goldfish congregate where this waterfall enters the water. Either they like the additional oxygenation of the water, or they like the fact that food is being stirred up. Now, the descendants of those original fish are generally all little tiny goldfish, and in time, they'll grow up to be big fish. But most of those big fish, unfortunately, will become bird food. Last fall, we had some big fish, and we had some big frogs, and then one day the sky was darkened by these great wings, and a huge bird, a blue heron, almost as tall as I am, landed here, waded into the water, and began fishing out all the big frogs and all the big fish. Yes, some of those fish will grow into big fish, but the heron will be back. Well, right now, the leeks are probably the least impressive vegetables in the garden, but they're still in their infancy. They've got months to grow. Every few weeks, I pull in a little soil around the bases to blanch the lower ends of the leeks. And this soil is very fertile, but if your leeks are lagging, there's no reason not to add a handful of fertilizer as a top dressing when you pull that soil back down it'll assure fine fat white leaf base by fall well next door is our main crop of tomatoes growing in cages a pair of homesteads a pair of ultrasonics and a single celebrity celebrity is a tomato that's done well for us for years so well in fact that it's become the variety of reference it's not fair to say that a new variety did very well one year and that you're going to grow it another unless you compare it to a standard, a standard grown in the same year. And that's what this celebrity is for. In between the plants, we've got a few small patches of parsley. Parsley will go on growing even when it's partially shaded by the tomatoes and we'll eat it all the way up until frost. Next to it, are some seed-grown plants, Belgian endive or Whitloof chicory. This seed was planted way back in April. 
but you could still sow it now. It's a long growing crop. In the fall, I'll dig up the fat, white, carrot-like roots, twist off the tops, throw them away, store the roots in cold storage until I force them in the dark into those lovely, dense, white chicons that constitute Belgian endive. Well, next to that is a planting. A parsnip, parsnip seed is very slow to germinate, so slow to germinate that some people give it up for lost. And then three or four weeks after they've sown it, here come the individual plants. Long season crop, we won't harvest the parsnips until next spring. Now this is an early planting of tomatoes, semi-determinate variety called Jetstar, and just look at the fruit that's in under there. The secret to growing early tomatoes is to start the plants early. The problem is most people don't have greenhouses. We do, and we'll go to great lengths to get the very first tomatoes on the block. This is a semi-determinate variety. It doesn't grow very tall. I've saved all the stems, tied them up to a stake. I guess I should have put a stake in that's a little bit taller. I'm afraid they're going to overtop it. Now down in next to it, I've got some plants of a variety called Tigerette, a novelty tomato. Not only is the foliage a rather light yellow, but the fruit will have stripes on it, something I've never grown before. Well, here's another little lesson, the lesson in uniformity, or rather the lack thereof. This is radicchio, that classic ingredient in Italian salads, the red, slightly bitter leaves and center head. And breeders have been working hard to grow plants that are all identically the same, or all identical. And clearly, they've got a little ways to go because here's a plant that's bolted, not in step with the others. Well, what's desirable for the, home, for, the, for the home gardener is not necessarily absolute uniformity because who's going to be able to eat nine heads of radicchio that are ready on precisely the same day? What's good for the commercial grower is not ideal for the home gardener. The home gardener has to eat some heads prematurely, some when they're just right, and is going to miss some altogether. Well, here's something that went completely by on us without us ever having a single taste, and that's this oriental radish. This was advertised as being the only oriental radish that could be grown successfully in the spring. Didn't make any radish at all. It has bolted to bloom. Maybe it can be grown successfully, but not here and not in the spring. Next to it, the far more familiar turnip. They are, they are bulbing up nicely. Just look at the fatness of that, that bulb down there. And beyond it, another oriental green called I can never say it correctly, uh, and you're not likely to see it in many gardens, but we find it both attractive and tasty. Well, let me show you a great success story. This is my favorite. This is the Colorado potato beetle story. Ordinarily, the first sign of Colorado potato beetles are the day glow orange eggs on the underside of leaves. These hatch into fat, brown, gross, slug-like creatures that can strip all the leaves off a potato patch in short order. And I don't see any eggs at all. The secret, I'm convinced, is a biological control we've been using called Bacillus thuringiensis variety San Diego. This is specific for Colorado potato beetles. Two years ago, we sprayed regularly, got complete control, Last year we sprayed a couple times, also got control, and this year we haven't had to spray at all. We have it. I'm ready to apply it. But if they don't show up, I won't need it. And I consider it one tremendous success story. Over in this bed, I've already harvested 36 full-size heads of lettuce, and it's time to plant it to something else. But first, I've got to get out the last few remaining heads. Now, with the lettuce gone, I'm just turning under the mulch. I'm going to be planting a fall crop of cabbage and broccoli here. But first, to control diseases like club root, I'm going to pasteurize the bed with sunlight. It's a technique called 
solarization. It achieves all the benefits of chemical fumigation of soil without any of the health risks. Now, the secret is simply to spread a double layer of clear polyethylene film over soil that is smooth and moist. The purpose of this 2x4 is to provide an airspace between the two layers of plastic. At this latitude, it takes two layers of plastic and about six weeks to adequately solarize the soil. Farther south, a single layer of plastic and less time will do the job. And finally, I weight the whole thing down around the edge, sealing in the heat with a row of bricks. Although this technique was pioneered in the warm climates, it's proven to be just as simple and just as effective for we northern gardeners. For once, wouldn't it be wonderful to go into a nursery and see growing in a garden situation the things you're about to buy so you'd know what color they are and how big they get? Well, if you lived in the Seattle area, you could do just that. The locals here would tell you to go to Pat's Perennials. Now, Pat's is about a half an hour outside of Seattle in the town of Woodenville. And it's a remarkable garden, kind of a one-woman botanic garden with hundreds, maybe thousands of plants flowering or growing here. And if you really fall in love with one, you can probably buy it. Here's the genius behind all of this. Hi, Pat. Hi. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm glad to have you here. Well, how come the place is so deserted? It's gorgeous. Where well, is everybody? Well, we did this specially for you so that we would have the garden to ourselves. Oh, how nice. A private mm -hmm. tour. Yes, this is our day <laughs> off, actually. And oh, we're glad to have you here. I'm sure on a weekend this place is packed. Yeah, now, listen, it, this is kind of like asking a mother of six which is her favorite child. Right. But which are your favorite plants in oh, here? Oh, I have some favorites, and I could point them out oh, to you. Oh, please do. Let oh, I see. will. Uh, my probably my most favorite this time of year is the uh, is the penstemon when it comes in bloom. Oh, that is. And beautiful. it is a beautiful plant. Uh, this one is penstemon uh, baratai. Very, very nice plant. Is that a native here? Uh, it is native. I've had it for about 40 years. My mother has had my mother had it before me, probably another 30 years, and she really? probably found them in the mountains. Oh my gosh! So you've lived on this property quite a long time. Yes, uh, we've lived here all our life. My husband was born on this property. I'll be done. It was a homestead. Ooh. This is another penstemon here. That is gorgeous. Uh, beautiful magenta-colored one. This one's called Edith Eye, and next to it is the white one, uh, which is called Crystal. Not huh. quite as hardy as the now, other two. Wait a minute. These are kind of shrubby, aren't they? Yes, it's a shrubby plant. Uh, there are uh, penstemons that are uh, herbaceous. This mm -hmm. one happens to be uh, a shrubby one, hmm. which, which does root down with uh, air uh -huh. roots. It's easy, easy to propagate. Uh, here's one that we grow, but not quite so luxuriously. My goodness, yes, that sure looks happy. English daisy, Bellis perennis. Um, they bloom all summer, mm -hmm. keep them cut back, and they'll continue to bloom. And here's the red form of it. Yeah, the red form. That's beautiful. Yeah, the flowers nice. are... Yes, a nice plant. Really handsome. Yeah, pretty this time of year. Oh, and look at this columbine now. This is unusual. I haven't seen one like this. The flowers are really big. This is uh, Hensel's harebell, and it is a nice one. It, it has a different... Um, a little kind, short Yeah, spurred. very short yeah. spurred, uh -huh. and it's a, 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 a single tone. Uh, also, Great. it blooms early so that it doesn't uh, pr cross with the other columbines. Oh, how neat. Comes true to form. Now, what about this? Boy, this just glows out here under this overcast It's a sky. very beautiful pink this time of year. This is a lovely, this is called, uh, this is a lichnus called what I consider a uh, rose campion. Oh, really? Very, <laughs> very pretty. Uh, grows very easily from seed. <laughs> I should tell you that I tried growing that in Los Angeles once, and did it got you? this tall. Oh, it didn't. <laughs> it, it, it needs the rain. I, I have think to tell so. you, it needs the rain. Are these all saxifrages? Uh, many here? kinds of saxifrage. This one is a uh, moscata. This one is a uh, an mm. umbrosa derogata. They bloom this time of year, and usually for about a month. More saxifrages. Ooh, here's something I recognize. I've grown this, but not so well. 
Johnson's Blue. Johnson's Blue. <laughs> the true geranium. And it is a true geranium. I always tell people the pelargoniums are not true geraniums, right. but these are the ones that Beautiful. are hardy. And this is nice, too. And this is Aubrecia, uh, uh, Aubrecia deltoides. Uh, everyone wants the big, the, the big mat of purple flowers and right. that blooms early in the spring that hangs down over the rockery. And, and Aubrecia is that, and it is lovely. Well, all of these are growing out in what would be full sun on full a clear sun. day, right? Right. But what do you have for the uh, shady Seattle garden? I have some wonderful things for the shade. Well, let's go take a look. Okay, let's do that. So the secret here, the secret must be the soil pad. Nothing different about the soil. It's just good growing soil. Lord's blessed us with good soil up on this hillside. It used to be an old farm, and it just grows well. No manure? No. No, no compost? No, I don't use those. I use a little commercial fertilizer on top in the early spring, and uh, it's a time release, and it's, it, that's all I use. Well, you have been blessed. Yes, Ooh, it what is. is. this? This is beautiful. Oh, that is a beautiful plant called heucharella. It's a mm. cross between heuchera and, and tiarella. And it's a very, very beautiful plant. Very popular. Everyone loves it because it blooms all mm, summer. I can see why. Oh, what do I smell? Oh, <laughs> I think what you're smelling is that wonderful sweet woodruff. And Ooh. it's a wonderful ground cover that it just covers the ground all of May. It blooms the whole month of May. This and is it? The, the snow it. under the yes, trees here? it looks like <laughs> snow, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And you know what? In the evening, it looks like uh, a beautiful white carpet. And it smells so sweet. It's just a wonderful, mm. uh, full shade. A full shade plant. It needs full shade, and everyone loves it. Well, let's see some more of the shade garden. Oh, let's go we've got deeper lots into of the woods here. To see. Well, Pat, I've met your grandchild, so I know you're a grandmother. Yes, I have nine grandchildren. We've been very blessed to have that many lovely grandchildren. Well, how did a grandmother get into such an adventuresome and big business here? <laughs> well, uh, that was accidental. My daughter, Kathy, who is our youngest child, uh, needed money for her last year in college, and uh, uh, we didn't have the cash for her. And my older son said, uh, why don't you pot up a few plants, Mom, and, <laughs> and uh, maybe next year Kathy could sell them next summer when she's off on vacation. And I thought that was a good idea, so I did it. But the trouble was, Kathy decided to get married and left me <laughs> stuck with a business. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning on having a business. Uh, I raised six children, and that was, you know, that was enough for me. I had never worked out of the home before. And so I, just, I was, didn't know what I was going to do with that many plants. And I put up a sign out in the front here saying, uh, four inch pots uh, for 10 cent, uh, cents and uh, uh, gallon pots for a dollar. And, the people actually came in and bought them. I bet they beat down the doors, they and, did. and the rest is they history, did. right? It is, and every year it has increased and increased uh. until now. We're making a nice living doing it. Ooh, what is oh, that? Oh, How yeah, that pretty. is. This is a uh, Mechanopsis cambricum, hmm. uh, the yellow uh, uh, Welsh poppy, and it is a wonderful shade plant. It does uh, spread quite rapidly. But that's all right in the shade. Yeah. When, when you have a dark, shady spot and you have something bright something like that this. Something bright yeah. and sunny in it, the shade. It, it is. And it blooms about a month. Oh, surprising. Yeah. Surrounded by more of your sweet woodruff. More sweet woodruff. Wood more sweet woodruff. And it just, that just kind of spreads in big drifts. It just keeps coming down and down until over the years. So they, it's been in for 23 years. So mm -hmm. it keeps spreading. Well, I know you have a house down here somewhere. Are we on the right path? Yes, this is the path to the house. It's right over there. We call it the gingerbread house. Well, let's go over there. Okay. Oh, it sure is pretty in here, Pat. Well, this is our woodland area, and uh, it's kind of an accident that the woodland was even left here. Uh, my father-in-law, when he cleared the the field up there, it, this was supposed to have been cleared, and and it didn't, and it. The bulldozer broke down. He was very angry. <laughs> but many years later, when we decided to build here, we were awfully glad. We felt that the Lord had left us a wonderful place <laughs> to build our house and to make a garden, make a woodland garden. And that's, you know, we've tried to leave it natural, and, and uh, we, we enjoy the woodland. Well, you've done a nice job of augmenting it, too, with the, the trellis and the split rail fences and everything. And, but, you know, there is one thing missing. I mean, I'm in Seattle. This is the heart of rhododendron country. And I don't think I've seen any rhododendrons here. Well, I have a few, but I consider them the bones of my garden. That is that they give me the green in the wintertime, they and the sword ferns and the evergreen type of things. But uh, there are so many other things for the garden that um, the perennials are, are something that just last forever. Uh -huh. And uh, some, when we have a winter like we had this past winter, we lose our rhododendrons. Lots of people have lost their rhododendrons this year. 
And a lot, and I've lost the bloom on lots of them. They're not blooming like they ordinarily would bloom. I've had many better years than this. Hmm. But perennials never disappoint you. They're friends that last forever. No, I'm sure not disappointed. They're spectacular. In yeah. fact, I'm dying to try a few back home in L.A. Good, Do good. you think we could go do a little nursery shopping? Why not? Let's go do could it. Could we open it up? Good, let's do it. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, I hope you've been working on your five-minute home video to show off your vegetable garden. Here's how to enter this year's contest. The Victory Garden Contest is open to all amateur vegetable gardeners. To enter, send us a home video of your garden. You are allowed up to five minutes to present your garden. And remember, the judges will only view five minutes of your material. When you send us your tape, make sure it's queued up to the scenes you want the judges to see. Also, please include a list of the vegetables you're growing. Send those along with your address and telephone number to Victory Garden Contest 1993, care of WGBH-TV, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Mass, 02134. Eligible entries must be received by Friday, July 30th. And all entries become the property of the WGBH Educational Foundation and are not returnable. Well, come on now, folks. Get those entries in. A trip for two to Ireland is at stake if you win. Broccoli's on the menu today, and you won't find any finer single heads than that. What do you think, Marion? There was a time in the 1960s when every restaurant menu had six or seven kinds of quiche on it. And this crunchy green vegetable broccoli was one of the favorite fillings. Well, broccoli quiche is still a favorite in this house, especially when I add a little fresh crab meat to it. But the first step is to prepare the broccoli. And to do that, I separate the top of the broccoli, the flowerets, from the stem. And the flowerets get separated into little pieces and I do not throw the stem away. The idea is to peel off this tough outer skin, which is just really a thin layer, all the way around the stalk, just like that. And then I have all this tender flesh inside, which simply gets cut up into small pieces. Then I can use every bit of the broccoli. And when I've done about a pound and a half, I bring it over here to a big pot of boiling water, and in it goes. I'm going to let that cook just for about four minutes or until that broccoli is just barely tender. And meanwhile, over here in the saute pan, I have a tablespoon of sh chopped shallots. And they're cooking in a little bit of butter, about a tablespoon. Here's that fresh crab meat I was talking about. And what I've done is I've picked it all over and removed any bones. And then I'm just going to saute it for one or two minutes to evaporate any excess moisture from the crab meat. And I'll set that aside and let it cool. There. That's dry enough. I'll just remove that from the heat. Let's see how the broccoli's doing. Test that with a fork. That is just tender and still has a beautiful color. This is ready to drain. So over to the sink I go into a big colander. And then I'll immediately pour cold water over it to stop the cooking action. All right, now I'm going to just pat this dry. And now we need a little custard filling for this quiche. So I have three large size eggs that I've beaten up here. And I'm going to add one cup of light cream. This could be milk if you'd prefer. And mix that up. And that just gets a little bit of seasoning, some salt and pepper. And I like to add a few drops of hot pepper sauce and that's all there is to that now i've put the broccoli in a partially baked nine inch pie shell and the crab meat will go over that this crab meat's cooled down enough spread that out a little bit this is very pretty color here and then the custard mixture goes over that i'll spread that around a little bit there. And then I like to put a little bit of Jarlsberg on the top. This is optional, but I think it gives a nice flavor. That's about a half a cup of grated Jarlsberg cheese. And then this is ready for the oven. It's going to go into a 
preheated 375 degree oven and this should be ready in about 35 minutes now a good way to tell if a quiche is done is to stick a toothpick right down in the center if it comes out clean you're all set to serve broccoli and crab meat quiche a classic meal that has stood the test of time as you look at the plant of the week, this clematis duchess of Edinburgh, let me tell you that next time Bob Smouse is in Portland, Oregon, and Jim Wilson reports from Bishopville, South Carolina. Until then, this is Roger Swain wishing you good gardening from the Victory Garden. Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. And by helping you grow eyes, grow group and your local grow eyes centers, nurseries and garden centers, providing for all your yard and garden needs. Grow eyes. Stern's miracle Grow products, bringing the joy of gardening to generations of Americans. N.K. Lawn and Garden. Seeds, lawn products, gardening books, and products for the young gardener. Helping families grow for over a century. The Victory Garden Plant List is an annotated guide to the 400 plants in the Victory Garden which grow throughout North America. To order, send $7 to the Victory Garden Plant List, Box 2222, Southeastern Mass, 02375. This is PBS.